Europe is facing its worst crisis since the Treaty of Rome in 1957, when the whole idea of a united Europe was born. What's going to happen to the Euro? Does anyone still have a vision of Europe in the future? And who's in charge? We're live here at the European Commission for this special iTalk programme, a joint production between Euronews and YouTube Worldview. You've been sending in your video and written questions for the President of the European Commission, José Manuel Barroso. Mr Barroso, thank you very much for being with us. Um, on YouTube Worldview, we've already had President Obama, we've had Prime Ministers Netanyahu and Cameron. We're delighted to have you. The principle is very simple, quick questions, quick answers. We've received questions from all around the world, a lot from Europe, obviously. Um, first, a question perhaps on uh, what's happened overnight, Steve Jobs. It's a great loss. I think if someone gave a great contribution to the way we are living today, it uh, was Steve Jobs the way we interact, the fact that now technology is available to the common people, information disseminated. You are, I use it yourself, do you? Yes, I use, I use it a lot. And uh, I think uh, the world has changed a lot because of his creativity and his uh, innovation. So I want to pay tribute to his life and to his legacy. Okay, right, so the questions are from uh, everybody who's been sending them in on YouTube. Let's go to a first uh, video question from Belgium. Mr. Barroso, do you feel responsible in any way for the economic mess that we're seeing in the European Union at the moment? Direct questions, do you feel responsible for this in any way? I did not create it, but of course I feel responsible the way we are dealing with it, and we are making all our efforts. You mean dealing with it wrong, wrongly, or, or what? We are doing everything to solve it, but it's not easy. Between 17 countries in the euro area, between 27 countries in the European Union, I think we are making some progress, but frankly, I would like to have progress faster, because governments and parliaments are much slower than markets. Let's have another written question about the crisis uh, in Europe, which uh, has been voted on. You've been voting on these questions on uh, YouTube Worldview, and this is one of the most popular ones. Uh, here's the question up here. Uh, it's, uh, how is it possible to boost the Greek economy if no one can buy anything anymore? Everybody's talking, Mr. Barroso, about a double-dip recession uh, that seems to be we're heading for it. Nobody's buying things. How can we boost economy, not only in Greece, but elsewhere? One country, like one family or one company, cannot live a long time above its means. And uh, Greece was doing precisely that. So it is unavoidable now to have uh, fiscal consolidation to reduce the level of expenditure. This is unavoidable, and this is the consequence of wrong policies. At the same time, we are trying to compensate that through some measures to enhance growth. That's why I created a task force precisely to speed up, to front load the structural funds so that we can help some investment in Greece. But let's be frank, Greece and other countries that are living above their means have now to make some painful adjustments and it's unavoidable. But there's some indecision at the moment about uh, whether Greece will get the next tranche of 8 uh, a billion euros. We can't even decide if they're going to get it uh, in two weeks. Because it's a condition for that uh, tranche to be disbursed that they comply with all the commitments they took. That's why we have the so-called Troika now in Athens, the European Commission, with the IMF, with the European Central Bank, making an assessment of the situation. OK, let's go to uh, another uh, written question which was uh, sent in on uh, YouTube uh, Worldview. What about uh, the sanctions against countries that have been spending too much for half a century? Um, and over the last few years, has everybody been spending a lot saying, oh, well, it's OK, Germany will bail us out? Look, um, we have just now adopted, following the proposals of the Commission, uh, a reinforced stability and growth pact. That means precisely more discipline, more integration in the way we manage our national budgets to avoid uh, overspending, to avoid high levels of debt or very what, high deficits. Can deficit. I just ask you what integration exactly means? Does that mean fiscal integration? What does that mean? It means that there will be powers given to the European Commission by the member states to um, launch this investigation of excessive deficits and in due course to apply sanctions. 
And this is very important precisely because we cannot have a common currency without some kind of common discipline and to some level of integration the way we take decisions. So these are the stress tests, are they? No, this is not exactly stress tests. This is about uh, the way we manage collectively different national budgets. If you want to have a common currency, we need to have some kind of integration and common discipline for that. And now we have uh, agreed, all the member states have agreed, to reinforce those mechanisms. OK, another question on the theme of the economic crisis. This is another written question that was sent into uh, YouTube Worldview. Let's have a look. Yeah, why was nothing done sooner about state debt. We knew this was coming. Um, why, was, why was the European Commission not, not, not heard more strongly warning people that this was, this was about to come? Look, uh, in fact, we have done it. Uh, probably not so vigorously as we should, but in fact, the European Commission has always warned about the high levels of debt in our member states. Um, unfortunately, at that time, we had not all the instruments we are going to have now. And now the member states are ready to accept more Which, which common... instruments are these? For instance, uh, I've asked in the first mandate of my commission, I've asked to have the possibility of sending the Eurostat, our statistic, of, of statistic office, to look in the national accounts. And the member states did not give us that uh, uh, right. Now they have accepted. Because what happened is that sometimes the governments, they manipulate their accounts and they don't give the exact data. And now, because of the real mess where we are, there are there is a goodwill to understand that we need to manage this collection. What you're actually saying is that this is a, what, what the French call a crise salutaire, a, a, a salutary crisis. Yes. It's actually giving the European Commission more uh, power to uh, control the European economy. Yes, not more power for us, but more power for the Union as a whole. And in fact, if you look at the history of the European integration, it is precisely when there is crisis that we make progress. So I think that's what's going to happen this time. We will get out of this crisis stronger because now governments and also citizens are learning the uh, hard way the costs of not having sufficiently integrated policies in some areas. There was another question which was uh, uh, a lot of people asked on, on, on YouTube was what is the integration between uh, the, the states and uh, the European Union? How much can you work together to prevent this double dip recession? We need it. Uh, in the globalized world, it's obvious that if the Europe wants to count, if we want to defend the citizens' interests of Europe, if we want to discuss with our American friends or with China or Russia or others, we need a more integrated Europe. We keep our different uh, countries, of course, the 27 countries, the national identity. We are not replacing our countries by a new country, but we should have a stronger European Union where the member states put together some competence set so that we can manage collectively some matters of common interest, like the common currency. OK, Mr. Burrow, so this was the most voted for uh, question on a YouTube worldview. Let's have a look at it. Could you please explain in what way and how much money has been spent by the EU countries to bail out banks in the 2008 financial crisis? How much are we still spending now? Look, since 2008 in Europe, at least 500 billion euros directly to support the banks, which was, of course, a way also to support the savings of people in those banks and investors. But if you count with the guarantees, it is more than 1 trillion euros. And if you add all the measures taken to help the real economy, it's more than 4 trillion euros. So it's really a huge amount of money. So that this one is coming from our pockets, basically. From the taxpayers, of course. That's one of the reasons why I think it's only fair to ask now the financial sector to give a contribution back to society. So through this is your, your this Tobin tax, but yes. it, it, it's been criticised a lot, especially in Sweden, where they did it, and everybody left the country. Nobody wanted to invest in Sweden anymore because, because of the, the financial tax. That's, Are you not worried about... That's the reason to have it a global tax. That's why in the G20 we are going to push for having a global tax. But if there is not an agreement to have it immediately at the global level, at least we should, someone has to start, and why not to start it here in Europe? OK, we have another video question which was uh, posted on YouTube for Mr Barroso. It comes from Spain. Quería preguntarle que viendo estos días cómo algunos responsables de entidades financieras, sobre todo cajas de ahorros 
en el caso español. Viendo cómo estos responsables de estas entidades han hundido uh, estas cajas de, de ahorro y que en muchos casos ha sido en beneficio propio, yo quería preguntarle qué piensa hacer la Comisión Europea si en este sentido piensa dar alguna directriz o piensa obligar a los Estados miembros de la Unión a tomar medidas contra estos responsables, medidas penales pero también económicas. I don't know if you saw these pictures in New York even uh, last night. People are very furious. They, they feel that the banks have been getting rich. People are more and more furious. Um, can the European uh, Commission, the European Union, take any steps to punish these people? Yes. Uh, in fact, so far, this is national responsibility. This is the legislation of civic civilian or a criminal responsibility. But now we are going to come with a proposal for the kind of responsibility of uh, leaders in the financial institutions, personal responsibility for wrongdoing. So we what are going they to do? Come go, to, go to prison or they have to pay fines? We are, or we are going to, pay to, to criminalize to propose the criminalization of some acts. We already adopted, the Commission, some proposals for the um, remuneration of bankers. This is already done, our proposal. But now we are thinking about putting some kind of personal responsibility in the leaders of financial institutions for some wrongdoing that they may cause to the society. Okay, let's have another written question uh, here live uh, in Brussels for Mr. Barroso. So why is uh, Europe not seriously engaged in completely banning toxic bank assets and creating its own rating agency? Perhaps that would give us a better rating. I don't know if we had a European rating agency. And what about Dexia? What, what about these issues? Look, regarding the rating agency, European one, we believe it's not appropriate to have a public European public, uh, a rating agency because some conflicts of interest could come that could undermine the credibility of such rating agencies. But in fact, we are uh, now putting some legislation to uh, put the decisions of investors and the governments less dependent on uh, three or four rating agencies, because we believe sometimes this cannot be fair, and uh, also to improve the way this kind of data is uh, used uh, in the um, political decision making or also in investors' decision makers. I think it is important that. Regarding the first question about toxic, we Quickly. are doing that precisely. Uh, we are uh, now proposing uh, to the member states to have a coordinated uh, action to recapitalize banks and so to get rid of uh, toxic uh, assets that they may have. Where do you see the euro in 10 years time? It was a question a lot of people asked in one sentence. What's, what's going to happen to the euro? Uh, stronger, of course. So far, uh, many members want to join the euro. No one wants to quit the euro. OK, well, let's uh, change a theme now. We have various themes uh, that you've been asking uh, questions on on uh, YouTube uh, Worldview. It's 10, uh, 12 here in Brussels. Let's uh, change the theme to social questions. And we have a question from a Danish girl. Let's have a look. Hi, I'm Sina from Denmark. Um, I would like to ask you a question. What is Europe doing for me to get a better job opportunities? Straight to the point, what are you doing? Very nice name, Sign. <laughs> uh, um, we are doing a lot, complementing, of course, the efforts of our member states. We create an agenda for innovation. We are trying to deepen the single market because the reality is that we have a single market for goods, 500 million people in Europe, but there are still a lot of barriers in terms of uh, services, for instance, and so there is a potential for growth and creating more jobs if we really eliminate many of the barriers. Yes, we but have you've seen the people on Syntagma Square. They're not convinced that you're helping them to find, to find jobs. Of course not, I understand, but it was not the fault of Europe, to be honest. It was the fault of irresponsible uh, national budgetary policies. And in fact, the money that... Uh, Europe has put in Greece for the structural funds was huge, but only 24% of that money was really invested. And one of the things we are doing now is to try to help the member states to invest in a way to reinforce their competitiveness. And in fact, some of those countries, they did not make the most of this money that was given to them by the European taxpayer. OK, another question uh, which interests a lot of people, uh, again, a question a lot of people voted for on YouTube. Let's have a look. The point of law in the EU is that people should retire later than they do at the moment. But won't they occupy jobs that would otherwise become available to young people? It's an impossible equation. We don't have enough jobs. 
yes, but Europe has to do, needs to work more. Uh, if we want to remain competitive globally, we cannot do it by working less. So we need to have more input from labor. That's why we need to increase our um, employment rate. We try our goal is 75 percent, because if you compare to China with other parts of the world, in fact, we are losing that battle. At the same time, of course, we should have active programs for employment of young people. The youth unemployment is probably the most dramatic situation we have now in Europe. One out of five young people does not find a job. And what about retirement? We have different retirement ages. People in France retire at 62. Uh, in Britain, it's, 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 it's 67. Uh, there is not a single, um, let's say, limit or target, but we are asking member states to make their reforms in a way that their social security systems are sustainable. Because if people now with the longer lives, and that's good that now people live longer in Europe, the life expectancy uh, is going uh, uh, much higher, it's only natural that so that we can finance these, uh, let's say, retirement pensions, we have also longer periods of work. But it's a national responsibility. But generally speaking, all member states are taking uh, measures in what I believe is the right direction. Let's have another uh, video question that was posted on YouTube for Mr. Barroso. Commitments made by the European Union institutions and member states to combat violence against women, little progress has been made. Any attempt to resuscitate a nailing economy and society cannot ignore the issue of violence against women. So how do you propose to address this human rights crisis as you call for a stronger Europe? Fast and serious theme, what would you say? It's a very serious and dramatic issue, the issue of violence against women. Um, what we are doing, first of all, we have a European Charter of Fundamental Rights and the European Union is very strong in defending all those matters and rights and uh, all against fighting all kinds of discrimination, including discrimination against women. I think globally we, we are f have, having a very good role there. Having said that, we are establishing some networks and communication between the national authorities to avoid this uh, crime to go on. OK, we'll have just uh, one more uh, question uh, about social issues. Let's have a look. Are there any plans for harmonising European policy on social subjects like gay marriage, abortion and euthanasia? Uh, for example, gay marriage. Uh, people can get, gay people can get married in, in your country, in Portugal. Mm -hmm. In France, where I live, they can't. Yes. Why? We're all yes. European citizens. Yes, but the member states consider and we respect that that this a competence of national legislation. So we are going to keep it because there are different national sensitivities on that matter. At the same time, we have the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. We believe that there are some rights that have to be protected all over Europe. But these specific issues of gay marriage, of abortion, of euthanasia are a matter of national responsibility. But do you and think that will change ever? You seem look, to want it to. Look. In the United States, they are a country, and in fact, they have different legislations in the different states. Some accept gay rights, others don't accept. So in Europe, we cannot have also, let's be honest, a complete uh, uniformity in all aspects of the citizens' lives. As you say, in Europe, thanks God, now we can travel to all countries. Uh, in Europe, without restrictions, uh, people can choose where they live, but we cannot have exactly the same model uh, all over Europe for some of these more sensitive issues. OK, uh, the President of the European Commission, uh, José Manuel Barroso, asking your uh, questions that you uh, uh, asked on a YouTube World View. Let's change theme now. A lot of questions about uh, the vision of Europe and the way Europe works. Let's start with a, a first video question. If you were asked to come to the United Kingdom and argue the reasons for Britain staying in the EU, what arguments would you use and what would you do to convince Britain that the EU was the better place to be than outside? Harry Hayfield, Cardigan County, Wales. A genuine Welshman here. Um, my country is the most Europhobic country. They're talking about a referendum again of, of, of coming out. How can you convince them to stay in? I mean, look at what's happening. Look, first of all, it's a choice of the British people. I don't pretend to give lessons to the British people. If they want to be... But you can they, convince them with arguments that they, they should will, stay. They will be, will be happy because to have Britain. It's a very important country, and I will, will be happy to have Britain at the centre of the Union. But if the British don't want to be, no one forces Britain to be. This is very important because we are a union of 
countries that are democratic and free, and we are not at all imposing anything on people against their will. Having said this, what are the benefits for the United Kingdom? Look, United Kingdom can count much more in the world with Britain, with, the, with the Britain, of course, resources, but also with the European Union. Because today, in the globalized world, I mean, if you use the huge market, the biggest market in the world in terms of value is the European Union market. Uh, the biggest uh, economy together, uh, the biggest uh, donor of development aid. Also, the United Kingdom benefits a lot from the internal market of 500 million people. Britain is a trading nation. Britain can also push their concerns about openness through uh, the, the, the European Union. So I believe it's in the interest of Britain people, but of course it's up to the British people to decide. A similar theme on uh, another written question uh, that, uh, that was sent. Let's have a look at that. Despite the Lisbon reforms, Euroscepticism is at a record level and the EU fails to communicate in a practical way with the EU citizens. When and how will we see a meaningful change? In one minute, President of the European Commission, sell us Europe. Today I'm trying to do that precisely, to communicate through you. This is you. the first too, isn't it? You haven't uh, done yes, this exercise this kind before. of exercise is the first, but I've been doing other similars, and every time I have the opportunity to go to Europe and to communicate to people, I do it. But frankly, once again, it's not up only to the European Commission. Europe is not just Brussels. Europe is not just the Commission. Europe is also what we can do at national level. So I ask all the leaders at national level to assume their responsibilities. When they have a problem, not to say it's the fault of Brussels. And when they have something that's good, well, to say that is merit. Say, they're always going to say that because it's such an easy excuse. Yes, but that's not fair. Sometimes so if it is the fault of Brussels. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it is not. And so uh, what I don't think is fair is that when things go wrong, people put the blame on Brussels. When things go well, they say that they are married. We have to communicate about Europe, not only in Brussels, but in Paris, in Berlin, in London, in Lisbon, in Athens. We have to make the case for Europe because this is the most beautiful project we have built in history, to put so many countries, democratic countries, living together, sharing their competences. OK, um, another question that uh, YouTubers uh, asked. Why don't the people of Europe get to vote on the position of the Commission President? It's not very democratic, is it? Who elected you? Uh, the Parliament, European Parliament elected me. I was elected in my country as Prime Minister, so I was... You must feel there's a difference, though, because the people elected you as Prime Minister, and it was the Parliament. <laughs> yes, because we are uh, 27 different countries, 27 democracies, and so we have a complex issue of uh, electing a President of the Commission. It is a choice of the governments, and afterwards it is, or not, elected by the Parliament. And I was very proud to get that uh, election twice. Having said this, uh, in the future, we cannot exclude that possibility of having, indeed, a real election. I will be delighted if that happens one day. OK, we have one of your uh, compatriots, uh, Mr Barroso, who's asking the next uh, written question. Why don't we vote for a new constitution or have a referendum to see whether European citizens want a federal Europe or not? You get the impression that a lot of politicians are afraid of having referendums about Europe. The, the Conservatives in Britain wanted it before, but now they're in power, they don't want to do it. <laughs> yes, but... Because uh, everybody would say no. It's not a, only a political question, it's also a legal question. In some countries, referendums are not allowed, namely in matters of international responsibility. So, um, it's an interesting idea, because I am for the legitimation by the people, but in fact we are, and the, this is important to understand, we are a union of countries that have different constitutional rules as well. So, but I think we have to do that at national level to see what we can do to explain and increase, of course, the legitimacy of the European Union. OK, it's 10.24 uh, uh, practically here live in Brussels. The last theme is a uh, theme of expansion. And we go to uh, a question from France. Good day, Mr. José Manuel Barroso. Uh, Turkey involved itself in protecting Europe from communist expansion by entering NATO in 1952. Don't you think that it is the duty for Europe to accept such a strong nation which has been waiting for nearly 15 years in the European Union? Thank you. Just a, a brief comment. Does Turkey still want to be part of the European Union? Uh, I think so. I met recently the president and the prime minister of Turkey, and both told me they wish to become members. And there is a process of negotiations going on. I tell you it's a difficult and complex process. Also in Europe, 
there are people who support Turkey becoming a member, others who are very much against, that's the reality. And so this creates also this kind of frustration that we have seen in this um, um, some viewer that we have just now mentioned. The Commission remains committed to fair negotiations with Turkey. They have to meet some uh, conditions and we will engage on that process very loyally with our Turkish partners. Okay, another question uh, that was uh, posted uh, on uh, YouTube Worldview uh, on this uh, same theme, a written question. Why is the EU focused on expanding its borders when actual EU members are facing so many economical problems? It, it's a very obvious question. We yeah. can't even deal with ourselves, let alone inviting new ones to the party. This is almost the other side, because the other citizens believe exactly that we should not enlarge. I think the enlargement has been one of the greatest achievements of the European Union. The European Union started with six, afterwards nine, 10, 12, now 27 countries. We have a continental-wide union. And this is why I cannot be pessimistic about Europe. When you think sometimes Even ago- Even now? No, Europe was divided. Half of Europe was under dictatorship. Even my country, Portugal, but also Spain or Greece, sometimes ago were not free countries. And the Central Eastern European countries that now are part, look at Poland, how dynamic, how pro European they are. So it's a great progress. Now, of course, we have problems. I think we should do the, both at the same time. We should solve our problems at the same time, keep uh, our doors open, because Europe has a great transformational power. We are also helping those societies close to us to modernize, to respect democracy and to make uh, more free societies. Mr. Barroso, we had uh, quite a few questions on uh, YouTube about foreign policy. Quick answers, I'm afraid, because we're running out of time. Let's have one uh, question about foreign policy. Could you explain to the Tunisian people why the European intervention in Tunisia during the youth revolution was so passive while it's so heavy in Syria and uh, Libya, that's uh, under the responsibility of the person who sent that, the Tunisian eagle uh, they signed. What would you react? I quickly? will want to answer to the Tunisian eagle that I don't agree with the eagle. <laughs> because, in fact, uh, we have been supporting from the very first moment this transition. I was personally uh, in Tunis. Uh, Cassie Ashton has been, our high representative, has been there. Uh, so far, the transition in Tunisia has been peaceful, and that's great. So it was not necessary to use the, let's say, um, other kind of means used in Libya. Uh, but I think it is fair to say that the European Union was the first to support the aspirations of freedom of the Tunisian people. OK, we have a, a specific question, obviously, for you from uh, a Portuguese uh, viewer. Uh, let's have a look at that. As a Portuguese leader, you were a firm supporter of Timor independence. As a European leader, couldn't you be a firm supporter of Palestine independence? I'm going to press you for a quick, basic answer. I am a supporter of Palestinian independence. I believe the Palestinian people has the right to live in a state of their own. And in fact, the European Union is by far the biggest contributor to that. We are helping them financially to build their own administration and become a viable state. At the same time, let's be honest, there will be not a viable Palestinian state without peace with Israel. So I am for a Palestinian state living in peace with the state of Israel. The Jewish people also deserve the right to live in peace with their neighbors. OK, a final question. Uh, I said we had questions from uh, around uh, the world. We have a question, uh, I think, from uh, somebody from the USA, but it, it, it sums up things nicely. Let's have a video question uh, to uh, round off this program. Mr. Barroso, in your State of the Union address, in response to the EU's financial crisis, you propose deeper economic integration, firepower and firewalls for the euro, and treaty changes, which will dramatically change the EU. When you leave office in 2014 and hand the reins to the new Commission President, how will the EU differ from where it stands today? Oh. And I'm going to ask you to resume that in 10 seconds, if you can, Mr. Oh, Barroso. my God. But I'm sure it will be stronger. And in fact, if you look at the evolution, in the middle of the crisis, we have created a stronger union. Just now, 
We have stronger rules for the stability and growth pact. We have now European authorities for the banking and financial sector. So this is the instinct thing with Europe. Sometimes we need a crisis to make a real progress. So Europe will be stronger uh, in 2014 than it was uh, before. I assume that responsibility. Obrigado. Thank you very much indeed, uh, José Manuel Barroso. You've been watching a special iTalk produced by Euronews and uh, YouTube Worldview live here from the European Commission in Brussels. If you want to listen again to some of the President's replies, you can see the programme on both our websites. Thanks for your questions and see you next time on Euronews. Goodbye from Brussels. Thank you.